Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this latest episode of the Bibliosophia channel. I am your host, Samuel David, and on today's episode, I am joined by the man behind the curtain, Mr. Gabriel McCary himself. Hello. You know, what can we call this episode? And the bald and the beautiful, unfortunately, is taken. So uh. how about the, <laughs> the, the bearded, the bald... Yeah. And the beautiful we'll, we'll go with that yeah well all right <laughs> two bald we'll guys behind a microphone it's it's yeah it's exactly. of the course yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be a casual interview we don't really have a format that we're going to explore it's just going to be two no, bald I... guys just winging it back and forth <laughs> yeah i think that's the best uh i mean um yeah as we've just uh established prior to talking uh yeah I'm, a, I'm in a weird kind of in between space right now you know uh when it comes to experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis basically the evolution of anathema and all these wonderful new projects biblia sophia being one of them uh with your help of course and given that my entire uh, view perception uh the way i work at things is very much informed by whatever project i'm currently kind of like um taken by and working on uh yeah things shift and move tremendously and i do know for a fact that you know we are going to talk about uh my first book but my first book at this point in time has been yeah, it's been published for quite some years now, 20, 2018, that was, uh, for Orai. And that book was technically done, as in, like, finished writing around 2016. But I started writing it in, tw uh, yeah, in 2008. So that's, uh, you know, sometimes you kind of like look back and you're like, well, that, that feels like ages ago <laughs> already, you know, so much has happened in the world since then. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of like in this midway point also because my practice has changed dramatically through the years. And, um, and also that, you know, uh, I'm working on a follow-up book, but I, I, I'm a slow writer. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna point to or fault that on the fact that I'm a francophone, but of course the challenge is very much present. It's uh... well, I'm a slow reader, so <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right. Well, I think slow slow reading is the best. To be honest with you, um, I mean, in my capacity as self made man, so you know, self made uh, editor and publisher. Uh, there's quite a lot of ma like manuscript uh, going through my hands that I need to review, that I need to check out. And, uh, and even though, yes, I've developed skills and ways to go through a manuscript somewhat more rapidly, it's, yeah, it's an investment of time. Uh, it's always an investment of time. So therefore, even my reading time is very much separated in two. Uh, and, and the magic happens when you know the the reading part that needs to be mandatory so to speak for work purposes kind of seems to coincide in toto with uh this beautiful research of mine you know or something that resonates with me deeply that's that's wonderful but it's let's face it it's not always the case the case so so there's kind of like different reading times and sometimes i even have the very very casual you know like these whether it be a fantasy novel or anything, you know, just that just doesn't that falls outside that uh, slips through the cracks all the time. That you, you know, let's say I want to read yet again uh, a Tolkien book, you know, yeah. like uh, I'm always postponing this forever. Like they're there, you know, I have these beautiful new deluxe editions, and uh, I never know when I'm gonna get to revisit these books because that's literally the types of books that take forever for me to get to revisit or engage with unfortunately but there's a good reason i wouldn't uh I, yeah i wouldn't do it any other way so it is what it is it'll happen one day i guess so since this is going to be a casual discussion sure. i'm wondering if you know i i know the impetus behind biblia sophia and your desire to see a project like this come off yeah. the ground and yeah 
you know, take root and, and, you know, take on a life of its own. But I'm wondering if you would like to engage with the viewers and listeners, what is your vision behind Bibliosophia? What is the, the driving force that, Mm -hmm. you know, compelled you to put pen to paper in in the metaphorical sense. And, you know, at at one point to go with, with the previous host and now, you know, grab my name out of a hat and say, you, (laughs) I want you to handle this. Um, So, you know, give our, give our viewers and and listeners. I mean, uh, not to say that I'm always this spontaneous, but I will say the whole idea behind uh, Bibliosophia, if anything, is far from, uh, a rigid idea it's 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 not even fully fleshed out yet we are as we are doing it it informs like um certain foundational elements and eventually i hope this will grow and new elements will be introduced new ideas will be introduced and there's a couple of things however how it came to be was very spontaneous i'll come back to this but the whole uh, idea behind it very much falls in line or actually kind of like um, complements the entire vision I have for Anathema as a whole. So there's a vision, there's a definite vision, there's an ambiance, there's an environment around Anathema that for me is paramount since the beginning. But the thing is, whenever you're working on anything of, of the likes of, say, something you're very passionate about, but ultimately becomes your work, ultimately becomes your job, uh, ultimately is reduced to certain things that you can produce and put out in the world. Um, then, then the entire grand vision for it seems to be allocated certain smaller aspect and nothing else. Then of course, there's multiple ways after that to get the name out, get it circulating. So of course, you know, from a purely practical perspective, someone who's very materialistic, so to speak, or mechanistic in its way could be like, well, it's simple. It's a publishing house. It's nothing more than that. And it's a business. You you run a business, you want promotion, you want, uh, you want your name circulating on every platform or something like that. But insofar as like when I, uh, for starting Anathema, my goal was not j- to just start the publishing house. If anything, I had no idea this would develop this much. And for me, that was literally my my passion that I was doing on the side as I was like as I had a ca- career in a newspaper back then. Uh, I didn't need this this the, the extra work really is that I wouldn't have done it any other way. It was for me. The same as a painter puts puts you know paint you know uh, brushes to canva and does something with it. For me, that was anathema. That was everything I was pumping out through this and putting a lot of time, energy, and love into. And for the longest time there, uh, being a huge fan of yes, other YouTube channels, namely you know already kind of <laughs> already uh, <laughs> promoting somebody else's work. But, you know, uh, Dr. Sledge's uh, amazing channel, Esoterica, of course, being uh, among them. Uh, and shout out to the Foolish Fish, of course, Denis Poisson, a uh, good friend. Uh, and, but my idea was not to just be another channel competing somehow or being in the same environment. However, these are all channels I, I massively respect. It's because there's a lot of elements to a publishing house that needs to be, well, the the books themselves needs to be shown. They need to be presented in, in a proper way. Um, and also long form interviews, I find, uh, although you you see them a lot in podcasts and stuff like that, you see them less and less, I find, in, in YouTube form. Uh, that might be me just like mistaking it, but in the realm of the occult or esotericism in general, I don't see that many long form interviews. Often it's like a podcast kind of turned into wherein we might do the opposite eventually. Remember we talked about perhaps turning the audio into a podcast because a lot of people consume. Yeah. But the idea and the reason why it's not Anathema Publishing's channel and it has a different name and a different identity, so to speak, it's because 
it is literally for the love of wisdom and the written word. So I want to promote authors, plural, and very much possibly outside the scope of, of Anathema Publishing. Uh, because, you know, yes, at the end of the day, we can treat this as being like all, you know, all those independent publishers, small publishers like me. Uh, pretty much people who have, a, a, I guess, a similar background in a sense, wherein it's, they just felt so compelled to be a link in that great, great chain of knowledge, right? you know, and kind of like passing along the torch and, and be like, well, you know, somebody needs to do it. I, I love these topics. I love these authors. I love these subjects. You know, I want to put my all into this, all my money, all my energy, everything. And that's how I started. And I know it's the fact for a lot of other independent publishers out there and as a way, I wouldn't say as a way to give back because I am ultimately I com transparently knowing that this brings a certain attention to anathema. That's great. But there's more than that. I want to bring attention to the authors and their work and to other publishing houses as well, who just like me struggle with the same things, have the same similar set, sets of challenges, and who are just as passionate. And you can see it in, in the work that they do. In, in the work that they publish. And I think it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, small bickerings aside, small differences, small, you know, whether it's considered competition or not, it doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't. Uh, I, I'm so uninterested about whatever creates a divide and I'm more interested into what brings people together. And I believe all of these subjects do uh ultimately being bring people together maybe it's a you know maybe it's a seeing the whole thing with rosy glasses i'm well 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 aware of that as well but it doesn't matter to me it's a it's a great thing and that's why more and more i want to just to invite authors artists other publishers other you know just active people in the media like we were talking about it could, could extend to musicians could extend to uh Distributor, like it really doesn't matter. Like everyone that's passionate about these subject, you know, uh, and have maybe a practice or who are scholars or academics in the field. To me, this is a yeah, a wonderful way to kind of explore it all. And basically, I wanted to grow the ambiance, the environment around Anathema in this way that wouldn't be just about the little corner that I was able to secure with Anathema, but the, you know, a larger kind of a, a vision, so to speak. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I mean, uh, so just if I can go back on how spontaneous that was, but it was because the idea was there for uh, for the longest time. And I remember having put, you know, a couple of notes on the side. There was no name for it. <laughs> there was no uh, visual presentation, nothing of the sort. And all, all of this first started simply because um, the, the former host, uh, Michael Barnett, invited me on his show, uh, which is This Is Darkness. And it's mostly a podcast about dark ambient music. So again, I was kind of like taken out of my context as a publisher or, you know, or as a writer uh, and I, I was uh, I was on that show to basically explain why I'm distributing also dark ambient music on Anathema and explaining basically the same thing I'm explaining to you now uh, when it as it pertains to bibliosophia and the impetus behind it. It was because it, it works in my mind. I often jest, but I'm very serious about that. I'm no nowhere near unique, and I don't believe none of us are. But and there's a comforting thought there and then when I say this is that if I'm not unique then a lot of the things that I resonate with will resonate with a lot of people out there and it's a way to share that love you know I have a love for that type of music because it helped me at a certain time uh you know accompanying praxis accompanying uh reading you know all of these wonderful things that work you know around the act the sacred act of reading and 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 basically diving into a good book. Uh, so we had this wonderful conversation, and I was like, you know, if you know, if you want to do something about books eventually, 
we should do something together. Uh, so it really came right after the interview, as in like, okay, sure, why not? Then, and so everything came together there. We, you know, came, I came up with a with a name, like a visual identity, so to speak. And we rolled with this, but uh, like everything else, I believe it's, you know, <laughs> and you've come to realize this as well. There is a time consuming aspect to this. It's not just a hobby, you know. I was so happy that you said yes. <laughs> uh, I've been told that I have a face for radio, so. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard so, this one before. That's yeah. good. <laughs> when I've been told that before, I'm like, so what you're saying is I should just hide myself behind a curtain. And you know, that's that's typically how I've done things in the past. Like any interview that I've I've had, I've always been hesitant to to be on on camera because sometimes I have a hard time controlling the expressions <laughs> that come well, across my face. I remember one interview that I was on um <laughs> I don't think it aired. I don't think it aired, but there <laughs> were some went, questions. They went like, nope. <laughs> it, it was like, no. And it, it wasn't because of me. Uh, There's a lot of technical issues that went in, into it um, that that were not at all my fault. Because, you know, tip, typically the technical issues that I have are, are trying to get, you know, video edited properly. Or in yeah, the case yeah. with, with Harper, who was my first guest on, mm -hmm. on this channel, uh, we, had, we had to interview four separate times because wow the video yeah. feed was just awful and and thankfully you know she is she's a very forgiving person and very mm -hmm. compassionate and has been there and has has been in these these same shoes it doesn't matter if we make faces like it doesn't matter if composure is not perfect uh it depends on what you sign up in this life i guess but uh, uh yeah i wouldn't even bother it's weird to say but this is not for me uh, to play a role. Yeah. So I'm not playing a role, you know, like I might, you know, I'm just regular human being. I might stumble on my path and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, tr trying as much as possible to live according to virtue. But virtue is very much like um, a singularly subjective thing. Yeah. Uh, however, I do make it a point to live an harmonious life with whomever like enters this field uh, of influence, I guess, uh, because I have nothing but respect for people, you know, and it's very important for me. Uh, and it's it's part of my modest operandi as well, uh, in general, for, for, for the house, for everything that I'll do. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, it's, um, you know, coming back on topic, I believe you do a fantastic job. I'm so happy to say that you said yes. And I just it, I just think it deepens our bonds because we're both uh, uh, quite you know I think I think we we're to the extent that we're limited in our knowledge of this you know as you said to yourself there's still some challenges technical stuff that we're learning and the same was true for me with just being an editor and a publisher to begin with I I, I never studied in that sense you know to 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 be now living doing this for more than 12 years now uh you know my yes my professional de degree background is is in graphic design so that was a lot of help you know to begin with especially because it was pre-press so not so much the digital and websites and whatever like um people do nowadays for me it was very much one one feet in the world of, of press and printing and one feet you know with the computers and everything so I got my degree in 20, uh, yeah, in 2001, 2001. Um, and then uh, I was on the road for years, you know, <laughs> doing something completely different. Um, <laughs> yeah, completely Screaming different. into a microphone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, often, I was joking a lot back then. I was like, well, you know, in conversation, you kind of have to say it. And it was a weird thing because... For the longest time there, and I and I think to a certain extent, if I'm honest with myself, that lingering thing would always be there. People can think whatever they want from it, but there's a certain uh, there's a certain emotion that 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 that, that translate as a bit of the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. even when you're doing it full time, even that when that's literally the thing 
that pays for your rent at this point or that you've been engaged in doing for the longest time. So for instance, uh, insofar as like, since I'm old enough to, I guess, gather my thoughts and, and, and work on a certain kind of like philosophy and conceptualization of the world, I've always gravitated towards everything art related. You know, at a certain age, I was very much into the visual arts, drawing, painting, whatever, you know, you name it. Uh, then eventually, of course, graphic design as well. Then a bit of writing and I went to college, you know, dropped out of college. But, you know, that's another story. But at the time in literature um, and eventually music and metal music and extreme music and all of these were like a cathartic kind of like act, you know, uh, for me to express emotions and express also mysteries, you know, very much drawn to mysteries since an early age in life. Uh, we could get back to this eventually. But that being said, like this entire like life was weaved somehow around artistic projects. And yet I refused the mantle. I refused to call myself an artist as if there was something wrong with this for some time there. And then when I was living and doing like 150 to 200 shows a year, and being signed on a major label, you know, in the States, Century Media, uh, with my my then current band, uh, I and Dissonance at the time, uh, you know, like, I still I had a hard time discussing it with people as in, yeah, that's my job, you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, I, I would meet people or discuss in a bar or something like that, what do you do in life? And I was like, okay, well, I'm doing this. And it seemed like, it, it seemed it came with like a, a veneer a, an illusory kind of like it's as if I was saying something that was purely fantastical in a sense maybe because I had a hard time realizing it myself so I would have to somewhat downgrade it or you know level it to a certain extent because then then I'd be like oh yeah you know like I, yes I do 200 shows a year but I'm insanely broke like extremely malnourished I have like you know <laughs> I've changed apartments in the middle of the night, not paying rent for like <laughs> six or four, five, to, you know, like you know, a, a dozen times sometimes like in one year, it's like, it was an insane chaotic life, you know, that, uh, I, but I signed up for it and I did it for as long as I could. Uh, and, and then, you know, life change again, it, it is the way it is. And if anything, and that we could touch on this eventually, but if, if anything, I believe this, imposter syndrome or this 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 problem with me labeling myself with things that I was doing stayed and became uh, an important part of my view an important part of my praxis an important part of my entire perception of of the world and the mysteries wherein I no longer you know determine whatever would be self around activities and things that I do, you know, it's, it's easy to be interested in alchemy and doing alchemy and be like, Hey, are you an alchemist? And, and say, yes. Uh, for, for, for exchange purposes, I completely understand it. It is important because these qualitative element, uh, they do help in trying to convey a certain information or something, a message, or you know, just just in conversation. But no, I like I often <laughs> I often will work more towards deconstructing what makes these argument on the surface level true, uh, and yeah, completely uh, do without, you know. But that's a, <laughs> that might be another topic, I guess, uh, for another time. I don't know. <laughs> This will just be part one of a 10 part interview series. So yeah, it, it, it very, it very well could. I'll indeed, hold you indeed. hostage and, and uh, we'll just record for, for, you know, 10 hours. I'll edit it down. It'll be palatable for our viewers. <laughs> and then at the very All end, right. they'll be like, I'm going to have to watch this from the very beginning to comprehend everything that was said. <laughs> this or, or, one or yeah. <laughs> or or want to w wash themselves clean somehow or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. You kind of like you have to do so like when you prepare yourself, you know, for uh, for anything worthwhile doing. But um, 
Yeah. Um, you know, coming back on track, where were we at? Yeah, we were, I think we were on, uh, yeah, the, the, my whole foray into the music thing. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, definitely an important part of this personality construct that makes for Gabriel now. And now that I've said it, it's already passed. So, of course, yeah, that's, it's kind of like, a, it does seem like it's, um, if not a past life, then a parallel one. Uh, something I'm very intrigued about as well. But um, th this sometimes it doesn't feel any of it I can relate to anymore. Uh, these, these, I don't know, like I started doing uh, metal music around 15 years old. And up until recently, I was, I kept, I still had a band. I, ha I was part of various bands over the years, uh, mostly extreme metal. And uh, the last album I ever, you know, did vocals on was released in 2020, uh, you know, a few months after the beginning of the lockdown for the pandemic. So let's just say that didn't create that many waves. <laughs> it, uh, timing could have not been better. Uh, but but funny enough, the band is was and is still called Blight. I'm just no longer a part of it. But, you know, Blight, you know, releasing their full length album during a pandemic, well, it's thematical. <laughs> and like uh, the theme is pretty much uh, consistent, but, you know, it wasn't too great for, for visibility and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, I'm still pretty, I'm still very proud of that record. It's it's called Temple of Wounds. And um, and funny enough, it's kind of like uh, there's a, a several wink wink to whatever I'm discussing and whatever kind of like weird rambling I have in Orvai. Um, so I kind of took bits and part of there and kind of riffed on them for the lyrics and for, for the whole concept. Actually, even the cover of the album uh, was made by Jose Gabriel Alegria Sabogar. So the same artist who worked on all the illustration for my first book. And uh, we did something differently because he, um, it just so happens in Peru to have, I don't know, an enormous supply of, of human skulls. <laughs> I don't know, like a very different here in Canada. <laughs> uh, slightly <laughs> more difficult to acquire. Um, uh, the the, the uh, same goes for the for the U.S. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's kind of like, he's, well, in my estimate, very respectfully kind of repurposing them to, to turn them into uh, actual, like, art infused uh talismans mm -hmm. and um and he was showing me his his quote-unquote private collection and i was like wow this is incredible and i was and then it it clicked because jose is a pretty uh, popular artist uh, I mean, not, well at least in the milieu has been making a name for himself through the years and in the metal scene as well, like uh you know black metal bands like him like, mm -hmm. a lot and i, I yeah oh, his I, artwork I know, is absolutely phenomenal incredible phenomenal like uh yeah i cannot say enough good things about the man his vision his art and the relationship with the, that we have it's it's quite extraordinary but at the time i had the idea i was like would you be so willing to do the artwork for our band but instead of doing it on paper do it on on a skull as i like, oh so instead of doing a personal project that time around, this artwork was done with, with some of the direction that I told them, but also with some of the lyrics, some parts of the lyrics that were, you know, calligraphied onto the skull itself. And I was like, just just put, you know, just put a, 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 black, a black background and we'll take like 360 pictures of the entire, you know, art around the skull and the lyrics and everything. And that's going to be the artwork for the uh, album. That's utterly incredible. And and also uh, very chilling in a sense, because it yeah. seems to, you know, resonate with with uh, listeners of, of that genre of music and, you know, the, the, the lurid imagery of a skull, but this time something that that is elevated and, and almost sacralized. I see it. And it's, it's funny you should word it this way, because... That is also one of the many definition of anathema in itself. Uh, a lot of people are often pointing to, or you know, at least there seemed to have been a stigma when we started anathema, being that uh, because it was welcoming of 
a lot of like different traditions, a lot of different uh, cultural approach to religion and mysticism and magic and all of this good stuff that makes up for the, you know, esotericism. I mean, Anathema has never been like a company solely focused on Western esotericism, for instance, you know, uh, n or neither is it like a fully focus as, such as like, you know, great uh, publishing houses such as Shambhala or Wisdom, uh, wisdom uh, you know, publications. These are, you know, Eastern, you know, uh, religious uh, publishing house in a sense, but for me, it was always kind of like showing an openness to these mysteries and kind of like uh, giving uh, certain themes that everybody could have their own interpretation of. And that's what I wanted to create, this kind of intersection. Um, and um, Anathema, because it was welcoming of, say, more modern, and, 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 and I stretch, you know, more modern, contemporary, uh, westernized, uh, version of what the left hand pack is somewhat is you know <laughs> nowadays um and it's fine you know like for us that we would have some of that and a bit of like christian mysticism a la Jacob burma that you know just for all intents and purposes is very much down my alley in general or you know or part that i resonate with for my practice but nevertheless uh there was a stigma around oh this is the black magic type stuff and um and the name anathema does suggest that you know it stands in heterodoxy or or or, or kind of like heretical some, somehow yeah. to orthodox view and, and it's funny certain... because that was that was one of the questions when when i had mentioned or announced formally in some of my social media circles that mm -hmm. that my book was going to be published by anathema one of the questions that i had to answer was uh you do realize that they publish well at the time it was quote unquote satanic content and i was like not exactly i mean have you seen their titles who who yeah. told you this so it's really yeah. weird because um beside the fact that we've started a company with a periodical you know a yearly per periodical pillars Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that's it's been an ongoing thing since then. Uh, since the first one was released in uh, 2012, um, of course, yes, the 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 kind of like the I, I won't lie because at first it was very much uh, informed by my own praxis that was yes that I you know labeled somehow Luciferian you know at the time, but that's my writing and my it was my interpretation of mysteries at the time yeah but within pillars in and of itself uh being open to all types of authors from all parts of the world you would have stuff on voodoo you would have stuff on advaita vedanta you would have like tantric material you would have like you know of course western esoteric stuff even christian mysticism you would have so many you, you would have um, Palo Mayon, but you, you would have so many different aspects, you know, because as I said, the periodical was giving a theme and any anyone who wanted to engage and submit something around it was free to do so according to their own specific, you know, practice and view. Uh, and yeah, the, the, that was the thing from the get go. But just because we said yes to a few uh, and we will continue to do so, for, but more from the left-hand path perspective, and some from the right-hand path perspective. There was there seemed to have been a cleavage into the the perception of the the entire uh, publishing house in and of itself. Now, as soon as we started releasing hardcover books, even our first title was not Satan Satanism, was not Luciferianism. It was traditional craft. Yes, mm -hmm. UK-based traditional craft. Uh, so yeah, some people will would lump anything, uh, you know, <laughs> close to witchcraft as being, of course, left hand pad or something like that. Okay, yeah, sure, but uh, most of the books we've released, even from then, really had more of a, uh, if anything, kind of like a midway point between this uh, a scholarly perspective, yeah, and a practical perspective, because. As a reader myself, 
it's not a distinction that I make. Uh, of course, I do when I read the book, but it doesn't play into what I collect, what I read, what I enjoy. And if anything, the two are very complementary. So I'm very much in tune and en enjoying of knowing more about the history of a, a specific uh, field or a specific um, mystery school or something like that. And often these discoveries and these new commentary and, and the, the entire scholastic field around it will inform and somehow enhance even my, my practice, right? And some people can come up to me and have a solely speculative, you know, like let's, let's not miss, mince our word, but, uh, you know, a new iteration, speculative, subjective, as I did with my first book, you know, it's very much what it is, contemplative aspect of, you know, through their work or their interpretation. And it's, in my book, it's equally fine. You know, if the material is good, if it's well-written, if I feel it brings something to the table, then, uh, then yeah, like it's, it's wonderful. And also through the years, I've come to more and more also remove myself from the color of the publishing house, you know, because it's not because uh, for 12 years now, I've been operating this on my own, but I can definitely, I believe to a certain extent, but to the, exmo to the utmost of my volition, I can separate myself and look at a work objectively and be like, yes, this is not a cultural approach that I understand in the fullest because I don't have this background, but is it well written? Does it seem like it holds up, you know, from a, a research perspective? And if it does, I'll be like, this is amazing, you know? And I'm often interested, I guess, into what, you know, shakes the foundation a bit, you know? <laughs> that might be just one of the things, one of the remnants, I guess, of, of the whole idea behind the house is that, I'm not so much interested into republishing age, age old like remars or works from the great masters, which I, like I said, like I'm the first one to engage with these books and still love them. But I want to bring uh, esotericism in the light of contemporary practice, you know, um, that's literally, uh, but th that's all there is though. Like it's not one tradition or the other and will never be because you know, yes, I have fondness or used to have like a, well, I say used to, it's all, it, it all depends on the angle, but I, have, I used to have a, like a huge fondness for everything left hand pop and then moved on to more, uh, I guess, exalted views. And even to a certain extent, most of the, of the great thinkers of the past that influence my work now, you know, will have to be like 17th century onward, almost Christian mystics, you know, and it's not because I've suddenly become a Christian myself <laughs> has nothing to do with it. If anything, it's because you've I, seen the light of the Lord and Savior. No, Jesus but I mean, like, you're right there. he's still looking at me all the time, you know, like, <laughs> but uh, it's, um, yeah, the, the approach is, has definitely changed, but mostly because of, uh, I would say a, a, a small or short, short foray into non-dual view, uh, and uh, everything that you know esoteric buddhism for instance and uh Tantra, like the, this these kind of approach really kind of uh uh illuminated uh aspects of other texts and of western cultures uh esoteric approach and narcissism for instance so when i'm re reading these texts nowadays if anything even though my foray into this this these practice and and these research have been short one but they'll never stop they've permanently altered my way of reading uh let's say gnostic material for the sake of it right but any material i i look at it in a different way nowadays and that certainly also uh opens up completely to the possibilities of so many more great work that could be published via anathema but coming back on why I said that at first, you know, you talking about the skull for blight, 
uh, being, you know, oh, it's it's funny. It's like something that's almost profane and you kind of recycleize it. That's literally the definition of anathema, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica as well. It's one of the many definition where in, uh, in the Old Testament it is said that uh, certain objects that were deemed profane or, you know, unholy somehow, but that be used uh, as a sacrifice within then a certain sacred context mm -hmm. would would be by the destruction somewhat resacralized and yeah. given new life. And to me, that's a weird, amazing paradox. And I'm very much fond of paradoxes, you know? So I, I, I think that's uh, definitely the more apropos definition for anathema. It's not so much to want to play the devil's advocate. It's not so much to want to shock or anything like that. You know, I have, you know, people who even hold orthodox view, I have nothing but respect for them. They just don't have the same type of respect for me. <laughs> or, you know, like that's uh, often, I would say, you know, the, uh, but that's why also like I used to say that my work was heterodox, not so much heretical, but like I said, like heretical, I believe is a value judgment that somebody else has put on your work. You know, mm -hmm. it's not some, well, you can embrace it. It's like any other term you can. So how do you say this in English when you, you can reappropriate it somehow, you know, yeah. like if you, yeah. if you, if you deem it necessary, then sure. But for me, the heterodox view was a bit more interesting because it, the root of the word actually means looking, uh, looking at things the other way or from another angle it's 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 not so much that it's wrong it's that it's you know another angle and i like that i like that a lot i think it's uh it still holds up to to the overall view of anathema i guess you know and let's face it sometimes orthodoxy is well for lack of better word boring <laughs> <laughs> You said it. My I'm going to have to defend uh, myself in the comments for that one, but it is I, a thing I, that I will probably die on. <laughs> well, it's it's funny because some of the, I mean, I mean, I, don't quote me on this because I could make a lot of mistakes, but uh, whenever I deep, uh, I, I, I dive deeply into, uh, say, the work of a certain, uh, you know, whether it be Jakob Burma or whether it be uh meister eckhart you know like or, or these 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 amazing amazing christian mystics who for all intents and purposes if you read with an open mind and all and an open art like it's absolutely non-dual you know like there's a, there's a great 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 mystery to be uncovered yeah uh, if you're not if you're not turned uh, uh if you if you're not kind of averse to certain words in certain ways of writing that are, you know, for all intents and purposes, yes, or comes from the medieval period onward, you know, uh, up to uh, uh, early modern period, you know. And of course, we don't necessarily resonate with the presentation, but what is said is deeply, deeply, uh, you know, from, from great contemplative minds. Um, but when you look at this, and then, like an, an historian would know better, much more than I do, because uh, I'm not an historian, of course. My entire approach is very ahistorical. Uh, but nevertheless, they'll be like, yeah, these these great, you know, uh, minds and these great, almost quote unquote, saints sometimes, you know, were orthodox and through their personal revelations, through their own special relationship with the divine of course we're branded heretics <laughs> or of course you know kind of like in their time or not or soon afterward or something like that we're somehow vilified for having had a different take on the mysteries and on on the divine and to me that stays with me it stays with me because I don't, uh, to which extent you make a conscious choice to research the, these, these wonderful philosophers of the past and be like, you know, this is what I'm reading right now is what made me fell, fell, um, fell in love with the mysteries in the first place. And yet, you know, these people 
at the hardest time being able to express it without any fear of retribution or whether any judgment in their time. Yeah, you know, whether you work for, it's, uh, hypothetically speaking, whether you work for any church and this is the system you're in and you're part of that group, you're part of that community. And, and for, you know, the equivalency of nowadays would be like these people were getting canceled for expressing their love of the divine in words, not, uh, you know, I, I don't know, like judge inappropriate. I think it's, it baffles the mind, it baffles the mind, uh, still to this day, I guess. So, yeah, I guess there's a part of me that, um, even though these people are no longer underdogs in, in, in the largest sense of the world, because of the word, because they're, they're, they've been massively studied. A lot of people have taken their, their, their mystical insight and incorporated them in their practice and their, so yeah, I think that's beautiful. If anything, through the ages, there's some kind of an historical redemption for the, for these people. And some people are doing it right now. Like uh, you, the recent interview with Shay, you can totally see that Shay has an approach where uh, there's a redemptory arc to even some of the more obscure or, or laughed at, or, you know, like the cried or, you know, whatever there is like a, there's a, there's, there's a, there cer certainly seem to be a movement where, in time, well, it, it always goes both ways, but you know, something that gets demonized can be resacralized, and the other way around is equally true. So funny enough, that ties in directly with the name Anathema. And of course, I've I've had your copy of, of your book, and yeah. I just, you know, as I'm reading it, all I can, <laughs> all I can think is, A, uh, this guy is is just as mythopoetic minded as as I am, and B, <laughs> sure. you know your your turns of phrase, your your you know nuance that you've you've included, like one of them, escape the demi mourned, which you know when I read it, I was like, aha, escape the demi mond, but also escape that which is mourned by the divine, or at least that's what I interpreted. Uh, yes. when i read it and you know reading into your later codices and even your references like this is material that again is opening my eyes to this facet or this this subculture in our overall spiritual subculture as a whole and you know it's it's giving me this new approach to the the luciferian current and you know, all of these things that, that I would otherwise have, have disregarded. So I really appreciate the material that, that you've written. And I know, you know, in, in my understanding of, of the history of, of your work, that it literally has gone through, you know, a baptismal, <laughs> a, a baptismal experience and, you know, very, very alchemical in that sense. And, you know, I, I can't, can't say enough about it so well thank you I it's mean, a wonderful just, contribution to to esotericism as a whole well thank you so much i appreciate it a lot i mean of course uh th this entire work was not primarily written as something that i intended on sharing or publishing we have to understand that i started loosely putting pen to paper for this around uh, 2008 and at the time there was no anathema in sight you know it wasn't it had it hadn't even dawned on me <laughs> quote unquote uh well i mean as a wink you know for for the for the name of the book or uh but yeah it's uh i was still a few years off even you know devising or everything came up to me uh when i was in you know in traveling so at the time it was very much like uh journaling like anyone would i guess having a practice you you, you kind of journal left and right and it was a very uh, puzzle like disparate um you know like uh, bits and parts of poetry uh bits and parts of, of, of philosophical pondering 
things that would come up to me, uh, symbolic concordances. And, you know, a thing is often, you know, like even the term alchemy can be very, uh, a very complicated and, je uh, terme en français, I have the term in French, like galvaudé, like a bit over, overly weighty term nowadays because of the new historiography around it, because of the fact that it got, uh, it morphed through time. It got subsumed by its own axiom uh, as being a royal art that was hard, you know, from an historical perspective, of course, it had nothing to do primarily. So it is prepared, you know, to be necessarily something that had to do with the spiritual world. Although some practitioner would have probably disagreed or actually presented stuff that uh, you know whether it be Zosim also who, who did have like some some out of a gnostic approach you know to to alchemy but you know that that you know just to take it back a little bit that's why also you know what I do is that I contemplate I'm, I'm more, much more of an observer of the alchemy that's all around me you know I, I'm, I'm an observer of the alchemy that rises and fall on its own accord, you know, whether it be within, without a uh, part of nature. And uh, through the, the observation of this, the contemplation of this, uh, I, I decide, I purposely decide to clothe these in alchemical verbiage, in alchemical uh, terms and symbology. Um, and same thing when it goes to my interpretation of Gnostic material. So, that's why I was like, well, okay, so yes, the kind of heterodox approach to me was deemed Luciferian at the time. And I was like, all right, and it's definitely much much more influenced by Gnosticism than it is everything else, even though it'd be complicated because Gnosticism is not one thing, of course. To, you know, but <laughs> no, it certainly know. is not. And I I did pick up on that as well as I'm yeah. reading. I thought this is this is yeah. a well, I mean, even the es current. escape the you know even the, the the part you just said like the escape the den demi morn is also a wink to a debate that's been ongoing about Gnosticism forever, and, uh, mm -hmm. and it was actually already the case with certain Gnostic schools where you had certain Gnostic school who would uh, very much agree to the fact that uh, to a certain extent, uh, Christ in and of itself and the crucifixion of Christ was central to a certain extent and was or could have been like a tragedy and that there was like an entire redemption around this wherein entire schools were not mourning this at all. Like if anything, that was a celebration. Right. And and it was the shedding of the, the skin of Mather. It was that was the central message was still, uh, you know, somewhat central to this crucifixion, but not interpreted in the same way. And as we go through the ages, you could see this being played left and right all the time, where some people see the symbology of the dead and risen Christ as a thing to mourn and. <laughs> And barely, like, and mostly half of the other people don't see this, this at all the same way. Either they don't care or they just, you know, uh, if anything, it's something to celebrate. And I thought that was a pretty funny way to, to put it because I was like, the idea is not to escape the flesh. It's not to escape also our current condition. And it's not also to escape um, even what would be the opposite. It's to escape this dichotomy in total, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like you escape the demi morn because one way or another, you're still playing to this duality and just, you know, you can do without, <laughs> basically. <laughs> anyway, that was just like uh, one thing among many things. But yeah, uh, I, it was very hard for me at first to, a lot of people were like, well, it's, this seems purely Luciferian as the entire book is dedicated. It's like, yeah, but at the time I had a peculiar a very specific relationship with whatever people would call Lucifer. And of course that was my guiding figure. That was my psychopomp. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, and he, he uh, let's just, for all intents and purposes, this uh, hope opened up a world of possibility and opened me up to a way uh, to alchemize the mysteries, you know, 
would you say that uh, this is a book that you wrote not not just as a expression of of your spiritual current or or your your spiritual influence but would you say that this is also a book that you wrote for young gabriel as a almost um, as a, a love letter to your younger self look this is where you are now yeah. and this is what you have to look forward to i mean th these are the kinds of questions that i always think about yeah. when you know thinking about i think that's a very good question others. yeah it's a very good question because uh in a sense absolutely because i believe that everyone basically does that to a certain extent everything that is somehow speculative or at least hypothetical enough that it's it's part of your subjective psyche you know and of course it needs to cross a barrier so whenever this this to me was a deep deep work of love and transmission and basically you're trying to define and put words to the ineffable Mm -hmm. And to experiences which can be deemed outside experience to a certain extent. And not everybody will know what I'm talking about here. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so, of course, you're bound to fail. <laughs> That's just a, uh, not to fail in the sense that you cannot share the inspiration. You cannot share the passion and you cannot share the love. And this is precisely what I believe the book does correctly. It is to share something that a isn't meant to be teachings so it doesn't posit itself ever as being teaching i do, do not posit myself as a teacher either and probably never will be uh that's why i refer to to myself within the book as the student eternal as in eternally a student and mm -hmm. a student of the eternal if you want to you know look at it this way and for me that was very very important and basically it was like look for instance all right. With my background as a musician or a touring guy, you know, a guy that used to be on tour screaming for a metal band. Uh, say after a couple of years of such wonderful, crazy experiences, uh, insight, uh, things you've learned along the way, the good and the bad, the difficult, how it is to maintain even a relationship within that much chaos in your life, everything. Right. And you want to write about it. Let's say let's say you do some type of travel log, you know, uh, of your entire life experience around these times. And of course you have quote unquote followers. You have people who are a fan of your music, who knows you a bit and who are interested on the basis of that. And perhaps they're contemplating getting on the road. They're contemplating starting their own bands and, they just, you know, they just want to have a insight, kind of like a, a, a personal peek into what is it to live that life. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the glamorous and the very unglamorous aspect of it, right? Uh, a lot of people are very interested in that. And and in a sense, Orai was that as well. It was my first foray into wanting to translate something you cannot that, that literally is non-translatable, but you can still somewhat point into a vague direction. And that's what I did. And so as I was writing it before it was a published book, I was still struggling with, okay, but what's the aim here? If I need to share this, why the hell would I, would I sh even share it? Um, and then it dawned on me that through the entire process of, of writing this, it was as if like there was an external, but you know, I'm I'm using the term external very loosely here, but kind of like a muse that has its influence on me. And the muse was the hypostasized version of inspiration with a capital I. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a deific version of inspiration that I was not calling upon. It was calling on me or actually I was traversing it. And I was recording the traversal. Uh, and as I was doing this, I was, of course, massively inspired, like the most I've ever been, because I was channeling this energy to the utmost. And I was like, well, having been this inspired, what if I were to share this inspiration with people around me? And hopefully people get that this book is not meant to be rep replicated 
that these operations are just hints at something greater, but they do show you how you can literally do about your business in the reality of now, in the, you know, like in, in, in our current condition, having jobs and, and having a fully devoted spirituality, nonetheless, and as an, as a, let's say a torch that I've lit, I'm passing along the torch and I'm saying, Hey, have fun, you know? And if you want to do so, you know, just share in the same process, do your own thing and share it along with people. Cause you never know. I think this, this, fount, this, this endless fount of inspiration is one of the greatest gift of humanity. It's one of the greatest thing that we can do between practitioners is to show each other how we went about translating the mystical, you know, but yeah. Uh, so we should probably wrap that up. We've been yeah. talking for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've certainly covered a great deal of material. Uh, yeah. You know, it's been a, a magical. Feel free to edit. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of editing. <laughs> <laughs> Think about sure. all of the profanity and all of oh, the incendiary yeah, statements and, and uh, you know, things that would get me canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, where can people find you online? Since we've already uh, talked about your disengagement yeah, yeah, yeah. with on with with social media. I'm yeah. sure you're well, still they, they, active. Yeah, well, they, they can't. Oh, they, they can if they want, but it's it, it'll be a good thing to say uh, on camera. Because you know how Facebook profiles have their that little snippet of description about yourself or something, whatever. Uh, it's plain written on there that I'm not gonna add anyone, anyone. Doesn't matter of how much like I we hang out like in real life. Like mostly uh, my old Facebook profile, the personal one. There's nothing on there. I've deleted pretty much everything. I don't care about entertaining none of it. I don't reshare. I barely interact with it. Uh, I use it for two things because uh, for some time there, I, I deleted it completely, but you know what it is with Facebooks. It's never fully deleted. It draws and also, you back it, in. Yeah. And, well, no, it's just they, they, they generally don't delete it. Mm -hmm. It's just inactive for some time, right? Uh, and they basically pushed me towards like, hey, you have to have an account that's legitimate, that is to your name in order to have the page. So basically the entire profile is just this to be an admin for, for the Anathema page. Yeah. Because you cannot have a page without a profile. And also I do use the Messenger app attached to the profile for communication with people that I work with, all right, and, and friends. So yes, uh, they can find me on Facebook, uh, but they can send me a message via the Anathema Facebook page they can't, but I, I barely never reply. Hence the, <laughs> uh, hence the auto reply that says, please send me an email. Still a huge fan of the uh, good old email. Which sifts uh, more but, people out. I've I've used that before. Uh, maybe, but you know, like, so people can reach uh, at anathema publishing at yahoo.ca, very old address, never bothered changing it, uh, .ca because we're in Canada. Um, and also uh, any orders, uh, that you know if you have an order or shipment related question then you could use orders.anathema at jmail.com um and what else um yeah I, I got a i got an instagram of course for for anathema and i do have a personal i think it's g underscore mccary anyway um it, that's that's my personal instagram but i just yeah I just post, you know, random books that I like, uh, uh, Thursday throwbacks of good bands, you know, stuff like that. Things semi related to my artistic career, so to speak. But yeah, and your, just... your book promo videos of your, 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 slip. yeah, <laughs> my slurp and blurbs. Yeah. That, that's, uh, yeah, so I'll put talk. the links in the description of the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just a thing I started very recently. I, I thought that was funny, and uh, they 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 don't in, they don't take much of my time in any day to do that slurp and blurb. And it's really just it's not going in depth. It's not a review. It's not you know my my genuine thought. Of course, if I 
post it, that means that I have some level of appreciation for it. But it's a way to showcase the collection, and it's a it's a way to bring awareness to these other publishers, to these other authors, uh, by showcasing their work, you know, in more detail. See how lovely they are, and yeah, usually like I can set up like the the the, the phone, you know, the camera, uh, very quickly, and I take my coffee and I shoot two or three of them, uh, showing a few books, and I pose them willy nilly whenever I want. It doesn't matter, like uh. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> All right, Gabriel. As always, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And, yeah, the pleasure you know, is all mine. Certainly got more ground to cover as, as the days, weeks, and months go by. But mm -hmm. uh, once again, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. And uh, out for now. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much again for, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. And... Um, and yeah, uh, I just want to say, uh, yeah, I'll finish with saying that I'm, I want people to know how genuinely grateful I am of their support through the years, through thick and thin, and the many followers of Anathema now is just a wonderful thing. I, I hope they're just in as much in love with, with whatever we're offering as I am working on these, and as the author that I've spent years sometimes writing this. And yeah, it's a, it's an incredible relationship and I will take any day the pros as a verse, you know, to the cons, uh, the, the pros far outweighs, you know, the cons. So I wouldn't be doing anything else. So I think we're good there. It's going to keep on going as much as people will enjoy it, you know? So have a good one, man. You too, dude. Cheers. Bye-bye. Sure. If you're a new viewer and would like to stay up to date with the latest from Biblio Sophia, be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications for our channel.